Welcome to this special edition of Legal AF. I'm joined today by Matthew Seligman. We are so lucky to have someone like Matthew with his experience, his unique experience and expertise to break down certain issues for us today. Uh, Matthew is a lawyer and legal scholar. He's based in Washington, D.C., and his legal practice, where he works for a firm called Stris and Marr, is focuses on Supreme Court litigation and election law. And he's currently a fellow at the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. So this is just so amazing to have you on the show to talk about all things election law. And because, uh, you know, that's a little topical right now, right? What's going on? And you just wrote a book called How to Steal a Presidential Election with Judge Lessig. Uh, or is he not? Is he a judge or a law professor? No, he's, uh, he's a law professor. Law professor. Yeah, yes, sorry, there's Ludig and there's Lessig. And yeah, yeah, so no, the, Lawrence. Yeah, no, no, I know who he is. The, um, the two Nordic election law people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Judge. Or I, I don't know why I want to call him Judge, but he's Professor Lawrence Lessig. I see a mm. copy of your book uh behind you, How to Steal a Presidential Election. Did you write this before 2020? And this is what Donald Trump and John Eastman and Jeffrey Clark and all of them relied on to do a roadmap on how to steal a 2020 election? Or is this something you wrote afterwards? I think. I uh, <laughs> well, so we certainly didn't provide the playbook to, uh, <laughs> to Trump and Eastman. And first of all, thanks for having me on. It's so great. Uh, to be here. Uh, so the backstory of this is that I was a full-time law professor for a while, and I was uh, leaving full-time professing to sort of do my current hybrid um, practice and academic thing in the summer of 2020. And I emailed Larry Lessig, and I previously taught at Harvard, with this paper that I had about how to manipulate the Electoral Count Act uh, to steal presidential election. And then he responded, let's go teach class together that fall. So we taught this class uh, at Harvard called Wargaming 2020. This was in the fall of 2020. And so we worked through with our students sort of in real time um, how you could manipulate the law to steal presidential election. And by the is time because, January... Is this because you saw what Donald Trump was doing? Uh, so it goes back further than that. Um, I remember in the fall of 2016, um, then candidate Trump had said quite famously that he wouldn't accept the results of the election when he lost. And I actually had my law school reunion the next day and was talking to one of my mentors, the election law scholar, Pam Carlin. And we were sort of talking about how this is a, a terrible uh, blow to the norms of democracy. This was in simpler times back in 2016. And you know, for whatever reason, we just started wondering, well, OK, so if he denies the election in 2016, you know, not great, but he sent some mean tweets. Who cares? But what if he refuses to accept an election loss in 2020 when he's president? And we both sort of had a light bulb go off. And so I started learning everything that I could about the legal architecture for how we translate from people voting at the ballot box on Election Day to January 20th. Uh, in inauguration. And it became clear to me at the time that the most vulnerable part of our system was this really obscure law that nobody knew about called the Electoral Count Act. And so that started the process of thinking about how somebody like Trump um, could manipulate the law to reverse the legitimate results of an election. And then in the lead up to 2020, we were deeply concerned about these ways of manipulating the results. But it turns out that the way that Trump and his allies actually tried to do it was about the most ham handed, um, poorly executed version of a legal coup you could imagine. But after January 6th, Larry and I realized that, OK, so this is something where, you know, we didn't publicize our our research prior to 2020 because we were concerned about it being used. Um, but we decided to write the book in the aftermath of January 6th because, you know, this is a ticking time bomb. And the idea that Trump's lawyers are not looking for ways to manipulate the results right now for the last four years, uh, I think is hopelessly naive. So the thing that we have to do now is be aware so we can try to the best extent possible to inoculate us against kind of legal machinations that are going to happen in 10 months. Can you tell us what some of them are? What are the biggest vulnerabilities? Yeah. Um, so I think the critical takeaway uh, is that the locus of uh, 
of catastrophic vulnerability exists mostly at the state level rather than the federal level. So in 2020, the two big concerns that people had were the vice president, would Mike Pence try to pull some sort of uh, move to override the election results, and then the objections in Congress on January 6th. And those were, in a sense, well-founded fears at the time, but things have changed now. Um, so Mike Pence did the right thing uh, on January 6th, but even that notwithstanding, we now have Vice President Kamala Harris, and she's not going to interfere in the Electoral Count. And then the Electoral Count Reform Act, which passed in late 2022, um, improves the Electoral Count Act. It doesn't; It's not perfect, and there's still some really serious flaws, but it does improve the system in some ways. Plus, as we saw, you know, the Senate is just not going to mess with things. You know, there were well over 90 votes uh, to uh, count Arizona and Pennsylvania's electoral votes, even though the Senate was split basically 50-50. So I'm less concerned about that kind of federal manipulation. I am much more concerned about state level manipulation. And in particular- Before you get to that, I just want to me, I just want to underscore something. So you're saying that the that the law that was passed in 2022 to fix the Electoral Count Act so that this can never happen again, you're saying it doesn't go far enough because that was no. passed specifically so that this can never happen again because of the um, vulnerabilities that you had identified in the Electoral Count Act, correct? Yeah. And, you know, I want to say that the fact that we got legislation of that kind on a bipartisan basis with, you know, well over 60 votes in the Senate, we should, you know, in this day and age, that is remarkable. And so, you know, I don't want to under uh, understate how, you know, how transformative that is to the extent that it, you know, tries to fix the problem, but there are still lingering vulnerabilities. Um, and those, those are really serious. Um, However, the critical way of thinking about these legal vulnerabilities is the intersection of the structural vulnerabilities in the law and the allocation of political power. Uh, and so if, you know, if the Senate were dominated, you know, there were 60 members of the Republican caucus who were hardcore MAGA Republicans who would, um, who would throw out the election results, I'd be much more worried, but there aren't. Now, you know, that's, a political claim that I'm making there. I think it's right. And, you know, that said, we see J.D. Vance this past week saying that he would have, you know, thrown out the election results um, and he wouldn't follow up what Mike Pence did. So, you know, maybe things are getting worse in the Senate, but I still don't think that there's going to be that much of a of a chaos caucus in, in the Senate. And so when you look at the intersection of these structural vulnerabilities in the law and the allocation of political power, that's where I start to get worried with states rather than the federal government. Okay, explain that. What 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 can the states do? So uh, there's there's a laundry list of things that they can do, and the the most terrifying prospects for me are the ways that state legislatures uh, can interfere in election results. And so your listeners may sort of be, have deja vu right now. So we just did this last year when there was this case at the Supreme Court about the so-called independent state legislature theory, which says that. You know, the Constitution uh, says that state legislatures get to determine the manner of congressional elections. That was the clause in the Constitution at issue uh, in that that case. But the same language is used um, in Article 2 about presidential electors, that state legislatures get to determine the manner of appointing electors. And this came up in 2020 as well, where John Eastman, our old friend, um, was, you know, the reason why he said that Mike Pence should intervene um, and reject electoral votes is because he said that states had violated what the state legislatures had done. The governors and election officials had departed from what the state legislature said. So we're having a little bit of deja vu here. Well, and talk there about remain... that Supreme Court case. Talk about the Supreme Court case. Yeah, so that, that case was called Moore v. Harper. And it actually intersects with what we're talking about in a couple of really important and interesting ways. So that case was about uh, congressional districting. And so, you know, the way that... Uh, the U.S. House works is that there are going to be a different number of uh, representatives for each state based roughly on population. And uh, then you have to draw lines of who's in, you know, which people are in which congressional district. And it turns out that if you, you know, have a powerful computer uh, algorithm, you can 
uh, you can draw the lines in ways that uh, advantage your party. Um, and this is this is a problem both in congressional races and state legislatures. So you get a situation, for example, in North Carolina, where that uh, case came from, the you know the state is split basically 50 50. Um, but there were um, something like 13 Republican districts, safe districts, and only two or three, Democratic differences uh, districts, and so you get this massive difference between you know what the people of the state actually voted for and how many members of Congress there are. Um, so the the case was about whether the state constitution can constrain how state legislatures draw those uh, boundaries. So the the Supreme Court held a couple of years ago that the federal constitution doesn't uh, doesn't have any enforceable limitations on how you draw uh, these boundaries. But that leaves open state constitutions. You know, we don't have one constitution in the United States. We have 51 uh, constitutions in the United States. And the North Carolina Supreme Court had held that this partisan gerrymander that the Republican legislature had engaged in uh, violated the state constitution. And the question at the Supreme Court was whether that enforcement of the state constitution violated the federal constitution because it infringed on the state legislature's federal constitutional power to determine the manner of congressional elections. And the Supreme Court actually, surprisingly to a lot of people, held that, no, that was fine what the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court said. Um, it said, you know, it can't go too far um, away from the text of the state constitution. But holding that aside, yes, state constitutions, as enforced by state Supreme Courts, can constrain uh, what the state legislature does. Um, that so, said, so is is yeah. North Carolina, so so just to make it so we understand, did they basically say the way North Carolina was doing it was okay or not okay? That uh, the way the North Carolina Supreme Court constrained the legislature that was thumbs up okay, which meant that what the legislature had done was thumbs down bad. Um, now there's a uh, unfortunate footnote to this story, which is that um, in North Carolina, Carolina, like a lot of states, um, state Supreme Court justices are elected, um, and there was an election um, during the pendency of this case, and the uh, the composition of the North Carolina Supreme Court flipped from Democratic control to Republican control. And the North Carolina Supreme Court reversed itself and said, well, actually, this huge partisan gerrymander is A-OK. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a typical case of, you know, there are 15 different court decisions. And even if you win at one stage, you lose at another. Wow. Um, so now the takeaway, though, for what this means for 2024 is that State legislatures have immense power to determine the manner of appointing electors. It's not totally unconstrained. There could be state constitutional constraints. There could be some federal constitutional constraints. You know, they can't, for example, discriminate on the basis of race and um, in violation of the 15th Amendment, things like that. But state Supreme Courts are not all that excited about constraining state legislatures. And the Supreme Court is going to let them do a lot. And what this sets up is a situation where there are strategies that state legislatures can use to uh, manipulate in either overt or in subtle ways the electors that the state appoints. And um, depending on what that strategy is, there are either little or no constitutional constraints on, on state legislatures doing that. And so let me give you a couple of examples. So the most blatant and extreme example of this is that, um, shockingly, in the United States, there is no federal constitutional right to vote for president. Um, and in the early years of the republic, there were no presidential elections in most states. Uh, so state legislatures just appointed electors directly. And that hasn't been true in most states since the 1810s, 1820s. Uh, there were a couple of states that continued to do this into the middle of the 19th century, but for over 150 years, we've had presidential elections, but there's nothing in the constitution that says that that has to happen. And so there are bills in state legislatures right now, like Arizona, for example, saying we're going to cancel our elections uh, for president and we're just going to have the state legislature do it and appoint whoever they want. And that is a stunningly anti-democratic move. And so you might wonder, how could they possibly get away with this? And the answer is, A, the legal framework allows them to do it. And B, 
of course, this is wrapped in a fiction of, oh, we, you know, our elections are so ridden by fraud that we can't trust them. So for now, we just have to, you know, we have to have the state legislatures, the true voice of the people, uh, appoint the electors instead. Now, that's the most extreme example in the sense that it's most blatant. And so I don't you, think that's going to happen. Well, before yeah. you leave that, though, tell everybody um, if you were to percentage the state, the state legislatures across this country, would you say they are Democrat, Republican? What what are what would you say? I know I know what my answer would be, but what's yours? So I think the three states that are most likely to do this are Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona. And so our old familiar friends uh, of swing states um, and the political circumstances in the, in those states are um, complicated. Uh, so, for example, Wisconsin, you know, it's about a 50-50 state. President Biden won it in 2020. But even still, because of an extreme partisan gerrymander in the state legislature, uh, the Republicans have about 65 percent of the state legislative seats and they have almost 70 percent of the state Senate seats. Now, as with, you know, we talked about this before. Now, the Wisconsin Supreme Court flipped from Republican to Democratic uh, this past summer. And there was a case to try to undo that gerrymander. And it looks like it may well happen. So, you know, we'll see what the composition of the legislature looks like in November. And there's also Governor Evers, who's who's a Democrat. So we'll see, there's going to be a conflict in Wisconsin between the state legislature, the state Supreme Court, and the governor. Um, then in Georgia, you have a similar situation where, again, you know, President Biden won and it has two Democratic senators. But even though the the state is split roughly 50-50 and has been trending Democratic, um, the state legislature is 55, 57, 59 percent Republicans, again, because of these gerrymanders. And so what this sets up is a system where a minority of the state that gets to elect a super majority of the state legislature can override the will of the people in the state in a presidential election. And that is the recipe for minoritarian rule. Minoritarian rule. I've never heard that before. Yeah. And there's good reason because that's not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed yeah. to be that the majority rules. Wow. Okay. So, so that's, that is one way to steal an election. That's a little terrifying. Um, what do you think are, what are some of the other ways that you're worried about? So I mentioned that that was the most extreme and most blatant. And because it's the most extreme and most blatant, you know, the American public has a greater appetite for anti-democratic authoritarianism than I ever thought possible. But still, the idea of outright canceling elections seems a bit too far, let's hope. Um, but there are other ways to accomplish essentially the same result. Uh that don't have the same blatant anti-democratic character. And so here are two. Uh, the first is, so the federal constitution says that states get to determine, state legislatures get to determine the manner of appointing electors, but Congress gets to de determine when states appoint electors. And that's why we have election day. And so that's why John Eastman's plan to have states, you know, appoint new electors sometime, you know, after January 6th, that was always a complete legal non-starter because you can't appoint electors late. That's just not allowed. It clearly violates the federal constitution and federal law. Not that that stops them from trying. Um, but, you know, we also all know that elections are not completed on election day. You gotta count all the ballots, you gotta canvas the results. There's gonna be disputes about it. And, you know, then the state canvassing board or state election board is gonna, you know, canvas and certify the results and the governor certifies it. And all of that is under federal law sort of implicitly allowed. Um, but there's nothing that says that it has to be a nonpartisan state canvassing board that makes the final decision about who really won the state. So you could have a state pass a law that says the state legislature is the final canvassing board and it gets to canvass the results and determine who, which candidate represents the true will of the people. So this isn't canceling the election, it's just giving the state legislature the power to decide who really won the election. And so you, they could say, well, in our judgment, there was just so much voter fraud in Fulton County or so much voter fraud in Wayne County in Detroit. And so we're going to, we can't possibly count any of those votes because it was too ridden from fraud. 
And if you do that, then suddenly Trump wins a Biden state because you're throwing out all of the urban jurisdictions that vote heavily Democratic. And there is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits this, at least under current law. There are arguments you can make about this violates equal protection, this violates due process of law, and I would make those arguments. But we would be in uncharted territory at that point. And the reason why this scares me more than the first strategy is because it looks or at least claims to be democratic because it's saying the state legislature is enforcing what the actual will of the people is because what it's doing is it's combating voter fraud. And this is a, a trope, a line that we've heard from Republicans for decades from far before the Trump era. You know, Trump obviously uh complains about phantom voter fraud quite a bit, but this is something that the Republican electorate has been primed to think is a huge problem for decades. You know, the pushes for voter ID, which have been happening for decades, have been predicated on the idea that there's massive voter fraud. So is it really that difficult to imagine a state legislature saying we cannot, in, you know, we just simply cannot count the ballots from these democratic jurisdictions because there's too much voter fraud. And so if a state legislature does that, then suddenly they're saying, ah, Trump really won. And then we have to bring litigation in the court and ask the Supreme Court to intervene in this sort of novel, unprecedented constitutional way. So it'd be like Bush v. Gore, but much harder, much more unprecedented and on that same accelerated time frame. So there are going to be lots of people who are watching this who are going to be mad at me for having you on and mad at you for writing your book because they're going to say you have just given the other side the roadmap. Why are you telling them how to steal the election? Um, what is your answer to that? Well, I, I take that concern very seriously, and I've thought about it um, for years working on this. And you know, at and that's why we didn't publish our work prior to 2020. Um, but at this point, I think it would be, be naive um, to think that Trump and his lawyers, I mean, his lawyers, uh, haven't been working on this, you know, and we exactly. see these, yeah, we see these bills already being introduced in the Arizona state legislature and the Georgia state legislature. So, you know, you have um, to educate you know, everybody else so people can fight back because they are, right. they are doing this. They are onto it. They are passing bills in state legislatures. They are they, they saw how close they came to doing it in 2020, and they are doing everything they can to get away with it. You know, it's it it's like it's like what I always said after um, the first World Trade Center bombing uh, that happened a few years before 9/11. Um, I have you know I live in New York, and so it's was very much uh, you know back then it was very much on everybody's mind and i used to say to people how come you're not scared how come you're not scared to be at 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 the world trade center don't you think that do you think that these people are going to stop do you think that that, that, that they're going to like there's still people out there who are who are doing everything they can to figure out a way to to do this right that's what the that's what they were you know back then it was uh, al qaeda was doing and sure enough 9-11 happened. And I just I remember my husband said to me, he's like, how did you know? And I said, how did you not know? Like it was so whatever. It was such a big. And to me, this is exactly that thing. Right. It's it's they tried. Um, thank God for Mike Pence and, and the other people who did the right thing. But they're trying again. And thank God people like you have written in this a book like this that we should all read. We should all get and we should educate ourselves and figure out how to fight back and how to make it so this cannot happen because it's not just a matter of whether Donald Trump is president although that would be horrific it's our very democracy our very ability to have elections that is at stake here and that's what they're trying to do they're they're using Trump you know this is just he's a he's a he's a an opportunity for them to you know, and I don't know who the them are, but what whatever it is, it's this this movement to to suppress democracy uh, that that is that is clearly happening. It's insidious, and 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 it's up to people like us uh, and you who did the heavy lifting by writing this book with uh, Larry Lessig to uh, educate people and inform people. So I'm I'm. I really think this is such an important conversation because this is not just 
Biden v. Trump. This is this is our democracy at stake. And and whether we're going to remain a democracy or do people want to live in in something different? I mean, this is it's just shocking to me that that's even a question. Um, wow. So any other kind of things that you think people should be aware of and and be be concerned about and, and things that people can do? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the most important takeaways is, you know, there's going to be lawyers like me uh, who have to get into the trenches and fight these new and, uh, let's say, innovative ways of trying to interfere with the law of presidential elections. But the single most effective thing that can be done is for people to vote in such massive numbers where it takes the election outside the margin of manipulation. So if you know, the premise of the book is that the election is close and close in the critical states where this might happen, like Wisconsin or, or Arizona or Georgia. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, if people stand up and say, OK, we're going to vote because we believe in democracy and we don't want to you know, sit idly by while a you know, minority faction of a minority pa party tries to manipulate the results of our free and fair elections in ways that would be unprecedented and lay the groundwork for this manipulation to persist on January 6th of 2029 when J.D. Vance or Elise Stefanik is the vice president and on and on and on. If people don't want that and they say that in sufficiently large numbers, then suddenly you have a victory of 200,000 votes or 500,000 votes in these swing states. Um, then it becomes really, really difficult for um, bad faith political actors to try to overturn the results. And so if it comes down to a Florida situation in 2000, where it's 500 and something votes between Biden and Trump, then there's a lot of opportunity for legal manipulation. If it's 500,000, there's much less. And so I think we all have a, a place, a role to play in what happens over the next year, organizing and getting every single person you know to vote um, for our democratic future is the single most important thing that that you know people who aren't election lawyers can do to try to uh, ensure that we have the democratic future that our constitution is supposed to protect. Um, I hope Taylor Swift keeps telling people to vote because. Uh... Thousands of people turn, you know, they register when she may end up on Mount Rushmore right next to our four presidents if she does. Yeah. Everyone's saying, you know, the, the Super Bowl is uh, is today when we're recording this. And they said, you know, who are you? Who are you rooting for? I said, Taylor Swift boyfriend team, of course. You know, I couldn't, <laughs> you, I couldn't even tell you really who's No, I know who's playing, but I don't really whatever. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, the timing of your book also is coming out at a time where the Supreme Court has a lot going on. Um, we've just had oral arguments in the 14th Amendment, Section 3, uh, the Section 3 case, where it's looking like, uh, based on the oral arguments, that that they're not going to, that they're going to keep Trump on the ballot. They're not going to remove him from the ballot. And of course, there's the tomorrow February 12th is the due date for Trump's writ of certiorari to if, if he's going to apply to the Supreme Court for the presidential immunity case that the that the DC Circuit just uh per curiam, per curiam uh unanimously well th the three judge panel unanimously mm -hmm. held that um that he's not that there is no presidential immunity um criminal presidential immunity in this particular mm. instance and so I, I think it's really important as well that you that the timing of your book because I I think that it's important for the 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 Supreme Court justices to understand what's really at stake here in some of these other issues that this is about democracy this isn't about Donald Trump or or Joe Biden and um it's really, it's really about, about all of that. Uh, um, I want to talk a little bit about, you, you mentioned John Eastman and um, tell, tell us about what you know about John Eastman and, and remind everyone um, who he is. I mean, he's, he's an attorney who, who um, 
and and you, chapter one of your book is called a coup in search of a legal theory and that's a, a famous quote by judge carter who found that john eastman along with donald trump was more likely than not to have tried to steal the election and committed a, a crime together um and so tell us all about John Eastman and and because you were very you've been very involved in him as well. So I'm going to toss it over to you. Ta he's 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 indicted in he's one of the he's one of Trump's co-conspirators in Jack Smith's case, but he's he's an unindicted co-conspirator, I should say, in Jack Smith's case, and he is a defendant in the Georgia Fonnie Willis case. That's right, and. So um, John Eastman, he enters the stage of um, of this coup in search of the legal theory as the principal architect of the idea that uh, Mike Pence, as vice president, um, presides over the electoral count under the 12th Amendment, had the power to reject electoral votes or some other way, you know, delay the electoral count, something like that, but interfere unilaterally. Um, in the electoral count. And this and that was culminated. That, and that was John Eastman. How, tell us who he is. Like, how did he come? Like, where does he come from and all that? So he is a um, lawyer and a legal scholar. Uh, he clerked uh, for Justice Thomas um, and then became a law professor uh, at Claremont in Southern California, which is a pretty conservative uh, uh, law school. And he you know, he'd sort of been a member of in good standing of the legal academy for decades. He was definitely very conservative and much more conservative than other people in the legal academy. And there were sort of hints of him having some far out views, you know, not just, oh, that's sort of a heterodox, you know, professor having a crazy idea, but really, really fringe. And uh, in particular, uh, whether... Um, whether Vice President Harris was was constitutionally el eligible to hold office. And so Vice President Harris was born in Oakland, but her parents were not citizens at the time. And so um, Eastman gave this argument that that means she's not a natural born citizen, despite the fact that she was born in Oakland. Um, and so there was... But I mean, it's just for such a smart person, how do you, how do you, like, I don't understand how he justifies that without being dishonest, right? Like that just doesn't make any sense. Is he is he just dishonest? I don't know the answer to that. And, you know, I think, you know, I should be careful about what I speculate. I, you know, I do know that based on the issues that I've I, I've engaged in um against him most, and we'll get that to, to that in a second, that I don't think that anybody um who is as an intelligent a lawyer as he clearly is, um, could look at these issues, actually do the work in good faith, read the documents in good faith, and come to the conclusion that he did. Um, and, you know, my takeaway from that is that motivated reasoning is a powerful drug. You know, whether he actually believes what he's saying, um, but has, you know, just wants to reach his conclusion, um, you know, at all costs, but he genuinely believes he's right, or whether he's just lying, I don't know. Um, but I do know, you know, and this is in the record that he has said publicly many, many, many times that he thinks that right now um, the American constitutional system is on the verge of collapse because Biden is in office. And so he thinks that the stakes are incredibly high um, in the other direction. So whether that means that he's willing to lie about the law. Um, to try to avoid what he thinks is a catastrophe, or whether that means that he's just so scared that his analysis is twisted by um, by his political views, basically. Um, I don't know, but one or the other of those has to be true. Yeah, I mean, look, at, at this point, he's on the verge of um, becoming a, a convicted criminal. And so I guess, you know, what they say, a, de a desperate man will say anything to, to save himself. I mean, because it's just insane to me. But um, go on. Yeah. So the remarkable thing about uh, about this or one of the many remarkable things, and this is where my involvement with Dr. Eastman comes in, is that he is the one and only person who has testified extensively under oath um, about what he did 
and what he thought. And so this came up in the context of his disbarment proceeding in California. So he's barred in California and um, the California state bar um, charged him with an with disciplinary violations for his involvement in January 6th. Um, and there are, there's sort of a list of about a dozen charges. And the core of many of them is advising President Trump and Vice President Pence that Pence had the power uh, to overturn the election. And Eastman advanced that view on the basis of a reading of the 12th Amendment. And the 12th Amendment is a part of the Constitution that governs the electoral count. It says uh, that the president of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open the certificates, uh, the certificates of the electoral votes, and uh, then the votes shall be counted. He uses the passive voice. And so Eastman picked up on that and said, ah, the president of the Senate, who is the vice president, gets to count the electoral votes and decide who won. Um, and if he thinks some of the electoral votes are invalid because of there was fraud or going back to the, you know, the state legislatures uh, didn't get to, you know, pick the electors that they wanted, then vice president gets to intervene. Um, and that was the core legal theory of January 6th, because, you know, on the morning of January 6th, President Trump is on the ellipse saying, you know, if Mike Pence does the right thing, you know, he just has to send it back to the states. And there was a gallows erected on the Capitol steps. That gallows was for Mike Pence as they were chanting, hang Mike Pence. Because, you know, Trump had told them that Pence had the power to do something and he refused to do it. And so John Eastman was the legal architect uh, of that. And so he is subject to this disbarment proceeding. Trial was last summer. And I was the expert witness against uh, John Eastman testifying that his constitutional theory about the vice president, there's absolutely no support for it whatsoever. None. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll find out what the judge says. In the disbarment proceeding. Wow. Um, in the disbarment and, proceeding. Yes, in the disbarment proceeding. So I just have a, a theoretical question for you. Let's say some of the states, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia, decide that they can submit whatever, whoever they want, right, for as fake as electors. They're, they want, they're not fake. This is who we decide. We're the state legislatures. Okay. And we decide... These are the electors that we're submitting, and they're going to be Republican. And we're not, we're going to ignore the will or the popular vote because we think there's fraud or whatever, whatever excuse they give. And they hand um, they hand Trump electors to Kamala Harris or mm -hmm. Kamala Harris. Um, do you think that her role in counting the electoral votes is ministerial or do you think she can reject ones that she thinks were fraudulently submitted? Or her role is her role is only ministerial. You know, and I think that this is a really important point. One, you know, most direct upshot is that for those of us who want to counteract these types of anti-democratic unlawful moves, you know, anti-constitutional moves by um, by a Republican state legislature, you know, I don't think we can look to the vice president as a safety valve there. Um, you know, and I can understand that it would be great in this particular circumstance if someone that you and I trust to you know, reach the right result had that power. You know, but that's not the way the rule of law works. It, it isn't that somebody has power if and only if, you know, your party holds that position. Right. But what and, if what if it's clearly fraudulent? In other words, what if it's clearly not they're not valid? Uh, so there is a mechanism for counting electoral votes um, and that mechanism, that power is held by Congress. Um, now, I wish I had more faith in Congress, um, but. That's where the power is, you know. And by I, you Congress, know, do you do you mean the House and the Senate? The House and the Senate. And so now this is a problem, though, um, because under the Electoral Count Reform Act, um, in order for a slate of electors to be rejected, it has to be both the House and the Senate that vote concurrently. And you know, House of Representative, the Speaker is currently Mike Johnson, who is a confirmed election denier. So you know. We'll see who controls the House of Representatives on January 6th of 2025. It'll be the new House of Representatives that gets seated on January 3rd. But if Mike Johnson is still the Speaker of the House, then do I trust him to do the right thing? No. 
Um, and so this is a difficult conclusion for people like you and me and your listeners who um, who really do want to protect the legitimate real outcomes of the election. Um, you know, do we take that as a starting point and then say, and therefore Kamala Harris has that power? Because if we do that, we're committing ourselves to one of two things. One is that, well, let's say Trump wins very well, could, could win. And at least Stefanik is um, running to be a successor. And on January 6th of 2029, as sitting vice president, she says, well, I'm running for president and I'm going to count my own electoral votes and nobody else's. You know, we're committing ourselves to saying that at least Stefanik has that power in that situation. Or we're saying we're not going to be consistent. And we're not going to play by the rule of law. And I understand the temptation to want to try to avoid the near-term bad outcome. Um, but the whole problem that we're concerned with among the election denying MAGA movement is that they're willing to discard the rule of law when it suits them. And so we're then faced with the devil's bargain. There are circumstances under which I think that, you know, Trump may actually be able to manipulate the legal results and outside of the Supreme Court intervening, I, there may not be ways for Congress or Kamala Harris to step in to stop it. And that is a catastrophic outcome. I don't think there's anybody on the planet who fears that kind of outcome more than me. But that doesn't mean that I'm willing to say that Kamala Harris can override the Constitution on the basis of a view that John Eastman came up that has no support whatsoever. Could she press pause and not count at all and then go to the Supreme Court? No. Um, so the, the the procedures on January 6th are governed by now the Electoral Count Reform Act, and it pretty carefully specifies exactly what can happen. And there's no power for her to hit pause. Um, you know, and whether the Supreme Court could or would step in at that point is an open question. You know, I think we've seen a consistent trend where the Supreme Court wants to stay out of these things to the extent possible, which, you know, there are maybe virtues of that, but there are certainly downsides as well. Um, and whether they would be willing to sort of let a stolen presidential election slide by. I don't know. But what I do know is that Kamala Harris has no power. Wow. Um, tell, tell us about uh, John Eastman in Georgia. What, what do you think of about what's going on there with him? Well, so he's under a criminal indictment as um, one of uh, Donald Trump's 18 co-conspirators in the Fulton County case. And so, as you mentioned before, he's Eastman is also an unindicted co-conspirator in the D.C. case. Um, and so he's subject to criminal exposure in, in both places, but in the near term, uh, his criminal exposure is explicit uh, in Fulton County. And, you know, so he's been charged with crimes and sort of all under the umbrella of RICO that this was sort of a, a broad criminal conspiracy among a bunch of people to overturn Georgia's electoral votes. Now, um, there are a couple of differences between the federal case and uh, the Fulton County case as pertains to Eastman, you know, because his um, his conduct relating to advising Trump and Pence that Pence could overturn the election. You know, there was this Oval Office showdown. You know, the fact that this isn't a movie yet boggles my mind um, where there's this Oval Office showdown on January 5th where it's Trump, Pence and Eastman where Eastman is trying to convince Pence that he has this power. So that's going to be at the center of the D.C. case. Now, the Georgia case, the emphasis shifts a little bit to the attempt to steal Georgia's electoral votes. And we haven't quite seen yet exactly how this case is going to play out, how much they're going to emphasize what happens in D.C. versus how much they're going to emphasize what happened directly in Fulton County um, in Georgia, you know, because of the sort of jurisdictional issues, you know, the emphasis is going to be, you know, and what we see in the indictment is that the emphasis is on what happened in Georgia. And he played a role there too. He was, you know, testifying before the Georgia state legislature, you know, about massive voter fraud and, you know, obviously was uh, involved in efforts to try to appoint, uh, you know, have the Georgia state legislature appoint alternate electors. And so Kenneth Chesbro, who's another lawyer who was involved in this, you know, was organizing these, um, fake or alternate electors. And so this is, you know, there was a lot of groundwork that had to be laid uh, in order to get to that January 5th Oval Office meeting with Trump, Pence, and Eastman. 
And Eastman was involved in all of that as well. So he's facing very serious criminal exposure, which makes it all the more remarkable that he sat on the witness stand. He could have pled the Fifth Amendment and he didn't. And so he talked for hours and hours and hours over days um, about what he believed about voter fraud, what he believed about Pence's powers, you know, and what you're talking about in the disbarment hearing. That's right. He testified Um, for days for days. When was this? Uh, so the trial was split up uh, a little bit because of some uh, delays on Eastman's half, but it, he started testifying in June and then there was a big break and then he finished testifying in August. Why didn't, why hasn't Jack Smith's, why haven't they brought a separate indictment of all the unindicted co-conspirators? I, I don't understand. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, I've seen a couple of different uh speculations about why that is. I mean, the answer is that nobody really knows, um, except people in the special counsel's office. I think the the explanation that makes the most sense to me is that this keeps the case simpler for now, where it's just... I I agree, but you can do a separate indictment of all... You don't have... They don't have to be indicted together. Do a separate indictment of all the unindicted co-conspirators. And, you know, one of two things will happen. Some might flip... Right. Mm-hmm. If you get John Eastman to flip against Trump, not that I, it's weird to I'm not 100 percent sure you would because you really don't need him for that Oval Office meeting. You have Pence yeah. as a witness, but. And he and he would have to tell the truth and say that in order to flip, he'd have to tell the truth and admit that all the things he did were wrong. Well, this is one of the remarkable things that I think you're getting at. You know, the facts are basically not in dispute. You yeah. know, in, in Fulton County, there's some facts that are in dispute about uh, sort of behind the scenes stuff. But in the federal case and with respect to Eastman, there's basically nothing in dispute, you know, and there's this incredible dynamic where so much of it was in the public view on TV in real time and on Twitter. Um, and then what we didn't see already, most of it they've confessed already. And so when it comes to the facts, you know, why were they confessing? Well, they weren't confessing. They were bragging. You know, because they think they seem to genuinely think that they were in the right. And so the facts aren't really in dispute. What's really going to be at issue in the D.C. case in particular is the law, whether what he continues to say he was trying to do. He was trying to get Mike Pence to do the right thing, whether that constitutes a crime. Uh, And so for that reason, maybe Jack Smith just feels like he doesn't need Eastman's testimony because what is he going to testify about? But why should he get away with it, right? Why shouldn't he be indicted? Well, and this is a key point for your listeners. He hasn't. And so the fact that he hasn't been indicted yet doesn't mean he won't be indicted at all. Now, that does bring up um, one of the elephants in the room here, which is, sure, he could be indicted if Jack Smith is still special counsel on January 21st of 2025. But if Trump is the president, the very first thing he's going to do is drop all these cases. And so the timing and the risk of delay in the DC case in particular is something that should concern everyone because, you know, days are ticking off the calendar. It's 2024 and we're only, you know, it's it's already, we're getting to the middle of February of 2024. And so, you know, these trials don't go quickly. So it's going to take you know something like three months to do the trial in DC. And we know that Trump is exceptionally skilled at delaying things and running out the clock. So in order for Trump's trial to reach a verdict before election day, it, it, we got to start moving. And, you know, Eastman hasn't even been indicted yet. And so, you know, he's been, let's say a loyal foot soldier for Trump. Um, and, you know, on day one, pardons John Eastman. Is the Supreme Court <laughs> pardons John Eastman along with everybody else, right? Including all the Jan Six uh, insurrectionists who are currently incarcerated and serving time, and who he calls patriots and and hostages. Um, what do you think the Supreme Court's going to do with the presidential immunity question? Do you think they're going to? Do you think that they are going to that they will um, grant cert or deny cert or what, what do you think is going to happen? And do you think there's a chance still that that case can go to trial before the election? I do. Um, you're right to emphasize timing here because there is essentially no chance that the Supreme Court ends up holding that he's immune. Um, and so it's not a question of what it's a question of when. 
And that's where we get into these dynamics of will the Supreme Court review the case or not? Um, and so we'll find out tomorrow. So uh, the deadline for Trump to file a, a stay application with uh, the Supreme Court is tomorrow. And so he'll file that, of course. And then and then we sort of get the branching possibilities. Now, um, I've done an analysis with Norm Eisen and, and Josh Kolb uh, sort of playing out the different timelines, depending on what the Supreme Court does. Um, and even if it re grants review on the case, it's still possible to get the trial done um, before the election, but it'll be exceptionally tight. So if the Supreme Court grants cert, you know, it's even if it does it on an accelerated timeline, like it did with the uh, 14th Amendment case, you know, it's still going to take a month uh, or two to get a decision. So we get a decision maybe in April or May, and trial doesn't start the next day because there's still a couple of months of pretrial proceedings. All of that has been put on pause during this appeal. So you've got to have a couple of months of pretrial proceedings, which brings us to maybe August. And the trial is supposed to take about three months, which brings us to late October. And so we could face a situation if the Supreme Court grants review and then does do it on an accelerated basis that we end up getting a verdict in the D.C. case in late October of 2024, just days before the election. Now, that's not the only possibility. Another possibility is that the Supreme Court takes the case and just sits on its hands and kicks it till next year. I don't think the Supreme Court is going to do that. I think it, the justices understand the context, even if Jack Smith hasn't been talking about that timing and the risk that Trump is then president and drops the charges against himself. I mean, the justices, you know, don't live in a cocoon. And so they understand that. So I don't think that there are five justices on the Supreme Court who want to give Trump a literal get out of jail free card where he doesn't even have to face trial because he pardons himself. Um, so the other possibilities are that they just can't do it fast enough. Um, and so it gets pushed to, well, we get a verdict in December or maybe in January. Um, and then there's the possibility that they deny review. And this is where your question initially was. And I think that there's a pretty good case that the Supreme Court shouldn't review this because it doesn't really deserve review. Now, on the one hand, and I think we have to concede, it's an exceptionally important question for the nation, whether the president, the former president can, is just immune from criminal prosecution, even if he was ordered you know, hypothetical that came up in oral arguments, if SEAL Team 6 to assassinate his political opponent, Trump's lawyer said, yes, there would be immunity there. That's a really important question. Uh, on the other hand, every single judge who has looked at this issue has said, that's crazy. No, you can't be immune for that. So rejected the claim. And I don't think that there's a realistic possibility that the Supreme Court is going to say that Trump is immune for that type of conduct. So sort of a foregone conclusion what's going to happen here. Why should the Supreme Court bother weighing in? So it could theoretically happen as soon as Monday, as soon as tomorrow, we're sitting here on Sunday, that the Supreme Court gets his stay application and says, we're treating this as a petition to review the case and we're denying it. So there is a world in which this gets back to the trial court really fast. That would be very aggressive by the court, more realistic as they sort of tell him, okay, you've got to file a a petition for a writ of certiorari for us to review it, but you only have five days. You only have 10 days. They get that. Smith responds the next day, and then they deny it. So I think it's more realistic that this would take a week or two, but I think there's a substantial possibility that the Supreme Court doesn't even bother to weigh in on this because Trump's argument is that absurd. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Wow. Um, do you agree that uh, the first, that, that you, you talked earlier that Trump was saying back in, I can't remember when you said it was, but um, he he has said over and over again that he wasn't sure he was going to accept the peaceful of transfer of power. Um, yeah. But what about the the when the case that is more likely to go to trial first, the Manhattan DA um, Alvin Alvin Bragg, uh, the Manhattan DA case. Um, I've always characterized it, and the media is now starting to characterize it this way as well, uh, that this was his first election, this first attempt to interfere with an election, uh, a much earlier one, right, in, when he was trying to suppress information so that so that he could be, win the presidency. Um, do you see it that way? What do you think about that? I do see it more like that than I think the conventional wisdom is, you know, and so one of Trump's superpowers is that he's perceived as so um, 
spiny and morally repugnant that he, you know, people can say, oh, this isn't a really serious case. This is just paying off a porn star. And in any other context, that would be a career ending way to characterize your criminal prosecution. But Trump has this superpower where he's already breached so many norms of, let's say, polite society or basic decency that, you know, he can he and his supporters can say with a straight face that, oh, this isn't serious because it's just a hush money case. But I don't think it is a hush money case. And I think you're right about that. Um, it's not just a hush money case. And so to see why, um, imagine what Trump's backers um, and the sometimes sober uh, legal analysts who say this is just you know a nonsense case, what they would say if it came out that President Biden had paid a couple hundred thousand dollars to one of um, Hunter Biden's business associates to conceal something incredibly embarrassing about Hunter Biden's life and had done that in late October of 2020. I think everybody would recognize that wasn't just about trying to protect his son. And uh, President Biden obviously has a an incredibly deep love and protective um sense of protective feelings towards Hunter Biden, but that's obviously political too. It's obviously trying to deprive the American public of something really important. And, you know, in the, you know, the, the Republican echo chamber, they kind of think he did something like that. They say that they were trying to suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. Of course, there was nothing on the laptop that was actually problematic. And also they didn't suppress the Hunter Biden laptop story. But if you think, like, if you have in your mind the conspiracy theories about Hunter Biden's laptop and you think those are a bad thing, then you think that what Trump did with the, the hush money to Stormy Daniels is a bad thing. And the reason it becomes criminal is because he broke the law to do it. Um, you know, he he concealed these payments and lied about it in official legal documents. You cannot do that. And this isn't just a matter of a you know, a paperwork violation. This is him committing crimes in order to deprive the American public of information that Trump himself thought was critically important uh, to their decision about whether to elect him. You know, this isn't just our speculation that the American public would care about whether he had paid off or whether he had had this affair uh, with Stormy Daniels. Trump thought that. How do we know that? Because he said so. You know, he's after the election, you know, one of his other um, overwhelming uh, personal characteristics is it seems he's very cheap, notwithstanding the fact that he's very rich. And he said, oh, now that the election is over, we don't have to actually pay her. Right. I mean, and that shows that the only reason he was doing it is to try to prevent it from coming out right before the election. And so Trump himself, like what he was trying to do is deprive the American people of information that he understood to be critically important to their decision about whether to vote for him. And he committed crimes to do it. That isn't just a paperwork violation. That is something that goes to the heart of people's, of the American people's free and democratic choice. So depressing in some ways. You know, the, the funny thing is my you think that's his superpower. I think his superpower is how he he's the I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say about me, you know, bounces off of me and sticks to you. Um, mm -hmm. He whether it's sure there was an insurrection on January 6th, but it was Nancy Pelosi or what. You know, he just he literally turns everything. He, he embraces it and then accuses you of it. And. And the reason I think that's a superpower is because when you talk to people who are not deeply entrenched in these issues, who are, who just want to live their lives, who don't really care that much about politics, they hear that and it resonates. They hear those because I hear people all the time just parroting stuff that he says and it's a little terrifying because he just lies and he turns everything on its head. It, it doesn't matter what the issue is. He really um, accuses other people of, you know, yeah, this is election interference. You know, like like the criminal cases are all election interference. And that's that's mm -hmm. what he how he's making that out to be when he he is actually being charged with election interference. You know, like he just that that to me is 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 anyway, go ahead. So, I, I mean, I think you're right. That's a um, that is a 
a common tactic that he uses. Um, and it may be his superpower, but I don't think that it is all powerful. And so the, I think one of the reasons why we should be hopeful about the outcome of the election is that although former President Trump is currently leading in the polls, that result looks like it would flip if he's convicted. Um, and principally if he's convicted in the DC case or the Fulton County case. And you might wonder, like, why? Like, how are there 7% of American voters who would flip their vote? Like, if nothing else, how have people not made up their mind on Donald Trump yet? You know, we surely have enough information about this person. And I think the answer is that, you know, there are a lot of people out there who are, as you say, you know, trying to live their lives, you know, trying to go out and enjoy a sunny day, watch a Super Bowl. Um, and they aren't as enmeshed in these somewhat convoluted legal cases. And and it can seem like a lot of noise where it's like, oh, it's just the two parties slinging mud at each other. Exactly. And, you know, once you look into it, then, well, no, it's actually not equal. But in order to get to that conclusion, you got to do one of two things. You got to be the sort of person like you or like me who actually you know, spends our time um, instead of doing more healthy things, we're spending our time, you know, digging into, oh, no, the, you know, the thing that Trump says isn't right. You know, it's not Nancy Pelosi who was interfering with the election. It was Trump and his allies. But you got to spend your time doing that. And a lot of people who are well-balanced people don't want to do that. And that's understandable. Um but there is another way to break through this both sides of, oh, it's just noise from, you know, all politicians are dirty and it's just noise from both sides. And that is a criminal conviction for a majority of his peers. And it seems like there is a critical mass of Americans who, yeah, like maybe they're tempted by him because they thought the economy was better in 2019 or something like that. And, you know, people are entitled to their opinions about that. But I do think that there's a critical mass of Americans who might be tempted to vote for Trump, even though I wish they wouldn't, tempted to vote for Trump. Um, because they think Joe Biden is too old or whatever it is. But if there's a criminal conviction, then they suddenly think, oh, this wasn't just noise. This is actually a really serious thing. And so I think, I think, I think you're right about that. I think you're right. I think people have decided that this is just two parties slinging mud at each other. And um, but if the jury, if it goes to court and the evidence is there and people testify under oath in a jury of that he chose, right? Because both both parties get to choose the jury that a, a jury of his peers that he chose if they find him guilty i i agree i think that i think it does kind of make it make a difference you know it's interesting i i, I think someone needs to tell joe biden to um dye his hair and spray tan and maybe that <laughs> somehow i mean because seriously they're they're the same age basically right they're i i don't get this whole he joe biden i mean there's two old guys running for president right but it doesn't mean that joe biden is, is too old and then you get you know her the special counsel her you know basically doing trump's bidding for him there with that i mean and then that's all anyone talks about it's just it's just crazy to me. And so that's why the most important thing is we have to get these cases to trial. Um, we just do. And and Trump sees that that's important as well, which is why he's doing everything he can to not allow that to happen. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. Any final words, Matthew? I'm so appreciative uh, that you are here and that you've taken a time out of uh, your Sunday to help spread the truth and spread the message, because that is why we do what we do here at Midas Touch and on Legal AF is so that the, the people who are watching the Super Bowl and enjoying their sunny day, if they want to hear the the facts and the truth and and what the, the law actually is and 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 what the evidence actually is they tune into these shows and it's really important and you're doing a huge service to the cause by uh and to truth by taking the time out of your day to do this so we really really appreciate it is there anything else you'd like to like to share with people well, thanks so much, Karen, for for having me on. It's really been a pleasure, um, and I'm so glad that you have the platform that you do to reach uh, your audience with, you know, real straight talk. Um, you know, and getting into the weeds about this kind of stuff is important. Um, and the thing I'd like to leave with your listeners is, you know, this can sound really depressing <laughs> and scary, and uh, it is scary. Um, but that doesn't mean there isn't anything we can do about this. Um, and 
that I think is the most important thing that you know, people can and must mobilize um, to put us outside the margin of manipulation to, you know, talk to your friends and neighbors, you know, who may not be the people who are listening to Midas Touch, um, but instead are going about their days, you know, cooking some hot dogs and watching the Super Bowl, you know, talk to people um, in an accepting and open-minded way, but ultimately share, you know, hey, this really is a serious situation and the country really would be in danger if Trump returns to the White House um, and is able to evade any kind of accountability for what he's done. So I do think that, that people, um, everyone has a role to play in stewarding our democracy through the next couple of tumultuous years. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Thank you, Matthew. I hope you'll come back again. And good luck to Absolutely. you. I hope, I hope you sell lots of copies of your book. <laughs> Thanks very much, Karen. All right. Take care. Love this video? Make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things Midas by signing up to the Midas Touch newsletter at MidasTouch.com newsletter.